Good afternoon, and welcome to the kickoff event for the 12th Annual Black Policy Conference. My name is Kimberly Branch, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the conference, along with Anamika Devetti and Halen Price. Over the past 11 years, the Black Policy Conference has grown into a hallmark event at the Kennedy School. This year, in partnership with the Institute of Politics, we're extremely excited to welcome Mayor Karen Weaver of Flint, Michigan, and Professor Christopher Robichaux. Today's moderator, Professor Robichaux, is a lecturer in ethics and public policy at HKS. Not only is he one of my favorite professors, but he has been on one of our conferences, <laughs> biggest supporters, and a strong ally for black and brown students. As a distinguished lecturer of ethics, he has taken a stance on incorporating racial and social justice into classroom discourse. For example, Professor Robichaux oversaw the development of the Eric Garner case study. And as a result, every master in public policy student will study social justice via Eric Garner as a part of their core curriculum. He also created an extremely popular course titled Economic Justice, which includes many things, but one of them, discussions of reparations. And in his Ethics and Public Life course, Professor Robichaux integrates ethics and the pursuit of civil rights through the comic novel showcasing big six civil rights leader, Congressman John Lewis. So we also wish to welcome Mayor Karen Weaver. Mayor Weaver is a politician, a clinical psychologist, a business owner, and of course, the mayor of Flint, Michigan. She came into office November of last year, inheriting a crisis that has been, that the entire nation has been watching, excuse me. In short, Flint's drinking water has been contaminated with extremely high levels of lead threatening to poison the city's residents, 57% of which are African American, and 40% of which live below the poverty line. As Mayor Weaver has stated, the people in Flint, Michigan were not put first. Although they had been speaking out about their undrinkable water since 2014, no one listened. This catastrophe has once again unearthed deep fractures in the nation's system that often disproportionately affects people of color. Thankfully, Mayor Weaver did not turn a blind eye. As the first female mayor of the city of Flint and a native of Flint, Michigan, the first action she took in office was to declare a citywide state of emergency, which was soon reiterated by President Obama, who also declared a state of emergency as well. Mayor Weaver has met with President Obama and has testified before the US House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee on behalf of the water crisis. As students of policy charged with asking what we can do, we are extremely thankful that the mayor is utilizing her political platform to put citizens' needs first, as this is literally a matter of life and death. Please help me welcome Professor Robichaux and Mayor Weaver. Thank you. Mayor Weaver, thank you for joining us. Well, I am so glad to be here. Thank you. Sure. Let's, uh, let's begin. I thought it would be a good place to start for everyone for you to give us a little bit of a picture of how you see Flint, Michigan, that your, your characterization of the city that uh, you call hometown and that you're now the mayor of. Well, uh, one of the things I have to say about the people of Flint are we are strong people. We, we say that we're Flint stone strong. <laughs> um, you know, we, we came from bedrock, so we're Flintstone strong, we're very resilient, uh, but it's a city of people that are, have a range of emotions, from anger to sadness to fear, confusion, uh, because of what's happened. We are a city uh, where I would say the trust has been broken, and that's been a huge issue, uh, but we're, we're ready for something to happen. We're ready for something to happen. You know, it was interesting because growing up in Flint, Michigan, we were Buick City. Right. And it was the place where, you know, General Motors, Bu Buick was their home. And um, to, I, I never thought I would see Flint in a situation such as this. So that's how it is. We're a city of 100,000, uh, but we're, we're, some, we're some angry people, but we're, we're resilient people. And um, we're tired, though. Yeah. It's a city where we're tired. It's two years now that we've been dealing with this water issue. 
And it's so interesting because I told people the water issue was originally not contaminated water. It was we were paying eight times the national average for our water. And so we were fighting and fussing about that. And um, that was how the water crisis started, was with the cost. I was wondering if you could walk us through, as you understand it, the, the timeline from a few years back to, 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 to you becoming mayor. Well, I'll tell you, we have been taken over by an emergency financial manager. And I don't know if everybody understands what an emergency manager is or not, but that's when the governor comes in and appoints people to run your city. So the emergency manager comes in and they really, they trump city council, they trump the mayor, they have all of the say so, they can take away your pay and that's what happened, pay was cut for a lot of people, uh, they strip away your resources. So, so they are the ultimate voice and basically it's a dictatorship is what it is because one person runs the entire show and so the people, the, the voice is taken. That had happened and that was about six years ago and it's interesting because they come in because they say it's to be fiscally responsible and to get the finances back in place, but we're worse off now than before the emergency manager came. Um, if, if you wanna talk about other things that happen under emergency managers, resources are stripped from the city. Uh, right now, we don't have city lawnmowers. We don't have city snow plows. Uh, the city uh, golf courses were sold for a dollar. We had a Genesee Towers, which was a building that was sold. It, it cost the taxpayers eight to nine million dollars. They sold it for a dollar to their friends and then charged the taxpayers a million to tear it down. Those were the kinds of deals that were made in the city of Flint. If you look through City Hall, it was basically stripped down to a skeleton crew. You know, I've told people, okay, let me look at this audience. A lot of you are too young to know what Mayberry is, but I've always said, you know, we wouldn't have enough resources in place to run Mayberry. And so with a water crisis on top of that, you know, really your, your resources have been stripped and so you're really at the will of the governor and the decisions that the governor makes. So that's what had been going on in the city of Flint was we didn't have a voice, our, our democracy had been taken. And, and, you know, let me say this, we used to own, we used to sell water. That was one of our biggest sources of revenue was Flint sold water. They sold our water pipe for three and a half million dollars. Um, so, uh, something that brought in revenue for the city was taken away. And um, th those were some of the things that happened under emergency manager. Well, another uh, thing to save money was we'll switch back to the Flint River. So in 2014, this was supposed to save us about 15 million a year. They switched back to the Flint River. Well, when they made that switch, corrosion control wasn't put in place and no one tested the water before giving us that water source. And immediately after, people started noticing there was something wrong with the water. It didn't look right, it didn't taste right, it didn't smell right. If you washed your clothes, they felt hard, or you'd notice buildup, scum buildup much quicker on your shower. People were complaining about their pets, you know, getting sick, pets dying. Um, and people cried out, and we were told the water was okay. Um, people complained about skin rashes and hair falling out and we were still told on all levels of government that everything was okay to continue to drink the water and so a lot of people did that and um, I remember you know it was just interesting because I know some of you have heard me tell this story but even while I was campaigning you know once we recognized here's what's going on with this water I said, wow, I had a press conference because I felt I had an ethical and a moral responsibility. I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and we knew lead was in the water and so I felt that it was my responsibility to speak out because I knew the damage, the irreversible damage that lead could do for, you know, for young kids to pregnant and nursing moms firsthand. So I had a press conference about this. I think it was the following week Virginia Tech came down to do some testing and that was because of a, a mother who had noticed their child wasn't developing. Um, you know, things were going well and then all of a sudden their child wasn't developing the way he should have been. 
and was going to get, you know, see what is going on with my child. So Virginia Tech came up and started testing and said that we had high levels of lead. Shortly thereafter, we had our medical community speak up. And the good thing about the medical community was we didn't know. They had been testing for a while. And because somebody said, well, how do you all know it was from the water and not other, you know, lead-based sources? But they had these kids' blood lead levels prior to, uh, you know, when we were still on Lake Huron water and then when we switched to the Flint River. And they were able to see that uh, for some kids, their lead levels had doubled, tripled, quadrupled. And so they spoke out. And um, still, you know, we started getting some attention, but not enough. Uh, so I think my election was maybe two weeks after that happened. And I kept saying the whole time I was campaigning that was when I got in, one of the things I wanted to make sure happened was uh, we declared an emergency because I felt like Flint should be declared a disaster area because of the lead contaminated water. And um, that's when our story really broke loose and people started knowing what was going on. You know, we had <clears throat> the grassroots people talking about it. We had a group of pastors that were marching and talking about it. But it wasn't until almost, like I said, a year and a half later that we actually were able to get our story out there and tell people what was going on. And once the emergency declaration uh, was called and the county signed on and the state and the federal government, uh, it was interesting because, well, actually at the, at the city level, uh, that was when Rachel Maddow show came in and really kept this in the national spotlight on a daily basis. One of your first acts was to declare a state of emergency. As you mm -hmm. mentioned, it was to be followed by uh, Governor Snyder doing the same thing and, and, right. and the president. From your description and, and the description of other people, a lot of, a lot of folks put the blame squarely on the governor mm -hmm. and his decision to assign these emergency managers, right. uh, robbing, state, I mean, robbing local officials right. of power. And a lot of people have called for his resignation over right. this. You are not one of them. So right. can you explain why? Well, I'm, I want to talk about both of those things that Please. you talked about, actually, because people have asked me, where do you put the blame? I said, there's enough blame to go around. When we had our local officials telling us the water is OK, we drink it every day. When you have the state people saying the water is OK, and then you have uh, the EPA not doing the part that needed to be done. So there's blame to go around. And one of the things I've said, because somebody one time said, are you getting cozy with the governor? I said, no. I said, but you know, I can choose to use my energy uh, fighting with him and trying to get him out of office. There's enough people doing that. I'm trying to get finances. I'm trying to get services and supports that the people of Flint elected me to help them get. And that's how I've chosen to use my time. Um, I'll fight. You know, I don't mind a good fight. And I do that when I need to, uh, even with having to um, file the notice of intent. You know, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to protect the citizens of Flint. And that was the reason I did that. But the other thing is you were talking about he was in charge. And so that's why we say the ultimate, you know, most of that responsibility is there. But we know there's enough to go around. Um, but it was funny because uh, one of the things that happened when I said, I am going to uh, declare an emergency for the city, I got so much pushback because Coming into office, we're talking about this emergency manager law, which I really hope people will, will look at, is I got into office and I had no power. And one of the questions people tended to ask was, what can you do any differently than the previous administration? And I've said this one of the few times I prided myself on having a big mouth. Um, because I said, I will, I will open my mouth and I will at least, you'll, you'll at least know this is wrong, here's what I think needs to happen, here's the direction we need to go. And if the people that are in place by the governor, uh, I said, if they want to fight with me, I told them, I said, you all can, we can fight or we can move forward. But I will be in the media every single day saying, here are the things that I think need to happen for the city of Flint. Here's the information that the people of Flint need to know. But they won't let me do it. And so that was how I decided I was going to have to get through this. In fact, I remember saying, I'm going to declare an emergency. And, and the people that were in place told me, well, you shouldn't do that because the governor will be angry with you. And I said, well, the governor didn't vote for me. 
and, and, and we're mad at him. <laughs> you know, we're mad at him. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, let's keep going. And, and that was what happened. But, you know, it was, it was difficult because I walked into office where I had my chief of police wouldn't talk with me. They wouldn't meet with me because they didn't have to. I didn't have any power. My, you know, city attorney wouldn't meet with me. My HR director wouldn't meet with me. So it was an interesting and difficult situation to walk into and try to have to make things happen. Have you had some of these powers restored? I mean, what's this? Well, what's you, your standing right now politically? Yeah, I have had some of I have. And, and, and what I had to do, um, I took a different approach. Uh, well, first of all, I said, you know, the water, the, our, our director of public works did not have the, the credentials to be a director of public works. We had an electrician instead of an engineer. Oh. And so I said, one of the things, because our trust has been broken, we have been uh, deceived, misinformed, uninformed, lied to for such a long time, I can't restore trust if I have this person standing with me. And so the next week after I got into office, he resigned. Uh, I said the same thing about the city attorney that we had because deadlines had been missed that cost us millions and millions of dollars. So I said, I can't go, that's who let our water rates be raised illegally. I can't restore trust with him. So those two people did resign. Uh, but then I had to say, okay, well, our homicide rate had increased 70%. Well, Governor, I guess you're okay with it because you won't let me get a new chief of police. And so I kind of put it back on him. Uh, there was a fire, our fire chief, I said, Governor, you know, if a fire breaks out, we have U, U of M uh, Flint is downtown. I said, and we have a, a chief that hasn't made it a priority to have the equipment that we need. So if that tall building catches on fire, we have students in there and we don't have the equipment to get to them. But if that's okay with you, I'll just tell them that the governor said that's okay as well. And so that was the approach that I took. And so that's when he said, I'm gonna let this lady have some power. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that was how I got the ball bo moving on that. Uh, that's great. I mean, I'm sure it's shocking to folks to hear, it's shocking to me to hear, mm -hmm. you're, you're elected mayor and you have to strategize and claw for any power whatsoever. Right. Maybe we can talk for a few minutes about how did the emergency manager law come to be? What was the justification for it? How did, how there did this There were some happen? bad financial decisions that had been made. That was what happened. And a plan had been put in place and there was a 10 point plan. The 10 point plan had not been followed. And so they said, well, and it was, it was really an interesting, interesting timing because we had been in and out of receivership. And it was not the campaign when I was running, but five years ago. And the governor told us, well, we're going to wait and let this election take place, but uh, I'm probably going to put in a financial manager, but we'll wait until after the polls close and we'll see how things turn out. Well, at four o'clock that day, there was breaking news that we were being taken over by emergency manager. And um, people stopped going to the polls at that point. It was, you know, what is the point of going? Right. What is the point of going? Um, so <laughs> it was just another way to disenfranchise yeah. people is what happened. So speaking on that, but that was why it happened, because of the finances. Because of the finances. Mm -hmm. Like I said, and we're worse off now than we were before. Right. Um, a majority of Flint is black. Yes. Do you feel that there's a racist component to this, even though obviously the water crisis affects everyone? Mm -hmm. It's hard not to read a racist component to this. Right, it is hard not to read that. And, it's, uh, and that's one of the things we've talked about, it being an issue of race and being an issue of class. And when you look at, you know, I just left a conference and we were looking at environmental injustices and I was telling one of the students that I talked with, Flint fits that profile of where these things take place. So it is hard to not have that in the back of your mind, that had this been a different community, had this been a community of higher socioeconomic status, wouldn't our voices have been heard then? Wouldn't we have been listened to then? So I, I, wanna, I wanna keep on with this for okay. a, a few minutes. Um, I think that uh, for, let me, let me step back, there's a new racketeering uh, in, uh, lawsuit going, mm -hmm. after, um, going after the governor. I don't know if folks are aware of that, but I think it just happened like yesterday or the, or the day before. Okay. And this, this, uh, this um, a, a lawsuit 
holds him and a few other people as intentionally responsible mm -hmm. for, for what has transpired. And I have a quote from one of the, um, from one of the, this is great. I, I've done my homework, right? <laughs> I want to hear the quote. Yeah. <laughs> And not from, not from the governor, no, but this is from um, Mark Byrne, who's a partner uh, with the, the law firm representing the citizens of Flint okay. and, uh, and bringing this lawsuit in. And he, he says that the situation is, in his view, uh, worse in one dimension than what happened on 9-11. And this is a quote that he says. He says, we haven't been attacked by foreign people. We've been attacked by those who are here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, do you feel this is an attack on on Flint, is this, is this an attack? Well, that's how we have felt, uh, especially when the, the guidelines clearly state that you put corrosion control in water um, and you don't do it, especially when you don't test a new water source. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, because we, all, we felt like we were under attack previously to this, you know, because Flint had a lot of issues and challenges going on anyway. We had the issue of uh, the high water rates, and, and a lot of people couldn't afford that. We had deteriorating neighborhoods. We had the high crime rate. So there were a lot of things going on in Flint that had this water crisis not gone on, we'd be addressing, and we're, we're addressing now. But you do feel under attack. It was almost, let the strongest person, if you can survive the cost of the water, if you can survive, we're not going to build the neighborhoods. If you can survive your schools closing, if you can survive being a school, a, a food desert, then I guess you can stay. And that's how a lot of people in Flint have felt and looked at things. If it is an attack, I think we have to ask questions of what the appropriate response is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was just thinking before, before this conversation, I sort of took a step back, and I'm, I'm being selective in my examples, okay. but, but, but here's, here's a, a threat. I'm looking at New Orleans right after Katrina, mm -hmm. and I see Mayor Ray Nagin shouting at the television, mm -hmm. would you pay attention to what's happening to us? Would, mm -hmm. would you please? He's being vulgar. He's doing anything he can to mm -hmm. get people to pay attention. I'm thinking of President Obama singing Amazing Grace, right, in mm -hmm. Charlotte, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of you, you know, a month or two after, a month after you're elected, declaring a state of emergency. And mm -hmm. I see these black leaders, and they're shouting, look at what's happening. Mm -hmm. But what's the way forward? What, what's the way forward for black leadership in these situations? It can't just be reactive. Right. If communities of color are under attack, mm -hmm. what's the way forward? And you know what? You're right. It can't be reactive. And, and one of the things, that's, what, that's how I felt we were being, really, because, just because of having your hands tied and all of these things coming at you at one time. And, and actually not being able to be in a position where you have your own team and you're just putting out these fires. That has changed. But one of the things we've talked about is, um, and, and not just black leaders, what I want people, all of the leaders need to know to pay attention to what's going on with this emergency management kind of thing. Because it is, and, and it, but what's interesting is they seem to put it in the cities, in, in our urban cities. It happened in Flint. It happened in Detroit. It happened in Benton Harbor. It happened in uh, um, Pontiac. And so you do feel like, oh, there's, there's a conspiracy here. And there's a certain segment of the population they're trying to get rid of or have all the control over. And so we've got to be, we've got to pay attention to that. And we've got to let our young people know what has gone on in the past and how we got where we are and to really be a voice and speak out and um, recognize that one voice can make a difference and that your voice does matter. Uh, because that was what I told people. I said, I, you know, you can't shut me up. And so that's one of the things we have to do. Sometimes I notice it looks like we're fighting with each other. And I said, you know what, we ought to have some goals that we can all agree on whether we like each other or not. That was one of the issues going on in Flint. They said, how will you all even work together? How will you work with city council? How will you work with? said, I'm, you know, I'm going to go in and be respectful and, and professional, and we're going to make this happen. And people need to recognize that, especially people of color, all eyes are on us to see what are we going to do, and how are we going to behave, and how are we going to handle this situation, and are we going to be prepared for this. Um, so, so you're right about that.
you're right about that. Great, I'm gonna ask one more question, but if I might ask folks who are interested in asking the mayor questions, if you could please start lining up at one of the four mics that we have here. Uh, we'll turn to your questions in a moment. The one last question is, uh, I know a lot of students here are, are really interested in social activism, and mm -hmm. this is a follow-up of what you've just said. Uh, and, and, and they see a divide. One is to work outside the system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, to, it's to work with Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? It's to put pressure from without. Mm -hmm. But then there are those who are interested in working from within, and, and you are working from within. So uh, you're mayor. Yeah. <laughs> um, what can you say about that, about that choice to work from within the system to at least you know, you know, hold elected office and try to transform a system that does attack certain communities from the inside? Well, you know, we need them to work on both within and on the outside as well, uh, because that's the only way we're going to wrap this around and get things moving. But, you, you know, I was, I was talking with somebody and I was saying, I don't think we've done a good job with young people as far as bringing them at the table and including them in on the conversation and valuing their opinions. When I look at Flint, that's one of the things I was talking about, it concerns me. I said, because our young people either stay there for school and leave and don't come back, or they leave for school and don't come back. And we haven't given them reasons to come back. I have, you know, my, my kids are 21, 22, and 25. And I'm asking them, okay, what do we have to do for you to want to come back. I don't, do I want them to come back? I don't know. Some <laughs> days I do, some days it's like, go ahead. But um, what, would I, what has to be in place for you to want to be here? And we have not done a good job. Uh, we haven't given them economic opportunities. We haven't put the uh, cultural and social things in place. We haven't given them the amenities that you need to have when you're those ages to want them to be there. Um, but the other thing is we've, we've had to open up and say, I want internships, I want students to come to City Hall and be involved in local government and see how we do things at that level. I want you to work through Black Lives Matter. I want you to work through all of these different ways, but I want you to be involved. And um, one of the things that we've had as a result of this crisis is uh, the young people have said, you know what, this is my home and I want to be involved. And, and that's been a good thing. I said, you know, if we don't make something good come out of this awful situation, then, then we've really missed the boat here. Great, all right, excellent, thank you. And I'm gonna turn to, uh, and go around to, to questions. Uh, we are all familiar with the drill, but just to rehearse it, please state your name, please make your question short, and in fact, make it a question, right. Uh, <laughs> make it a question? Make it a question, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll start over here, please. And I'm a Harvard alumnus. Um, I grew up in Durand, Michigan, oh, and wow. uh, my father was an engineer in Flint okay. for uh, GM. So uh, this topic is very important to me. And uh, my question mm -hmm. is about educational inequalities. Mm -hmm. uh, there's places like Bloomfield Hills, uh, Michigan, where there's great public and private schools for very affluent families. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, in the state of Michigan, there's great disparities mm -hmm. uh, between how much money a pupil receives based on where they live, mm -hmm. based on the value of their parents' property, which seems to penalize students. And so my question is, what can we do, do realistically to redistribute uh, you know, uh, income and taxes at a <laughs> state level so that pupils receive uh, an equal or a fair amount uh, in each school, no matter where they're living. It, it just seems that, to me, I was always uh, very frustrated to see those huge income disparities uh, for, for students. Right, in and, and you, when you come there, you, they are still there. Yep. And one of the things, even when we looked at, you know, what we used to get as far as revenue sharing and being able to do things, all of that is, you know, most of that is gone now. And that's a huge concern, and that's something that we've been talking about and fighting for a lot because it's greatly impacted us in not only that area, but a lot of other areas in the city of Flint. And the other thing is, you know, we're not, the mayor's office isn't, you know, the, the school is its own governing entity. And so one of the things I've had to let people know is while we're not responsible for the school, I feel like we have a moral and ethical responsibility 
to the school. And what we're trying to do in Flint is we do have some, some neighborhoods that are very stable. And so how do we start building those neighborhoods up? Because we know if we can get businesses to invest in those areas, if we can not do more than just tear down homes and start building homes back up and getting a tax base and stabilizing those neighborhoods, we know that's going to have a huge impact on, on the public school system in the city of Flint. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what, that, that's what we've been trying to do. But some of that money that we used to have, it's gone. It's gone. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. But thank you for that question. Hello. Um, my name is Henry, and my question is regarding um, the, you know, the emergency sort of controlled uh, mm -hmm. board and mechanism that they imposed on Flint. Um, <coughs> for much of the 80s and early 90s, right, D.C. was not just the capital, but the murder capital of the United mm -hmm. States as well, um, during the, like, Mary and Barry years. And, and the financial control board there, which Congress imposed, actually did have you know a, a meaningful impact in, in in taking the hands out of corrupt local politicians for you know enough time to sort of stabilize the situation. Obviously, in Flint, it had disastrous consequences right. in the opposite direction. What do you think of the policy of taking control out of local government and placing it you know with state or federal officials? And and when do you think it works, and when do you think it doesn't? Well, you know. It hasn't worked, in Michigan it hasn't worked very well at all, to be mm -hmm. perfectly honest. You know, it was, it was surprising that one of the emergency managers, that, emergency managers that we had in Flint ended up being the emergency manager for the Detroit Public Schools. And we mm -hmm. said, okay, I already had a hand in poisoning kids in Flint. Why are you gonna let them, you know, mess up the kids in Detroit as well? So it hasn't, we haven't seen the examples of when it has worked well. But, and the other part is they didn't come in and do what they were supposed to do. If you stick to what you're supposed to do, which was get us on the road to recover financially and then get out, that would be, a, that would be one thing. But that's not what happened there. So, um, so I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. And, and we don't like it just because, like I said, we, we didn't have a voice. Uh, they weren't listening to us. There were things we went to the polls and voted on that they said, too bad, doesn't matter. We wanted the ombudsman office back. We had talked about civil service. There were a lot of things we had voted on that didn't happen. And so it was, you know, they came in and did more than just let's get you on the road to financial recovery. We're going to do day-to-day -day operations and whatever else we want. So it was a bad thing for the city of Flint. Yes, please. And uh, for your leadership during this crisis. Uh, my name is Will Eberly. I'm an MPP2 here at the Kennedy School, fellow Michigander from Grand Rapids. Okay. Um, this is part of what I see as really a perfect storm that's hit our state. Mm -hmm. uh, you have education cuts. The governor's education advisor resigned very quietly in the middle of the night, I think two days ago. Mm -hmm. You have the road funding crisis. This is happening. Detroit public schools. You see young people like myself leaving as soon as we graduate from college, mm -hmm. not being able to come back. What do you see as a viable way forward for the state? Because it seems like there's just so many problems facing the state right now. Where do we start to turn it around? Well, one of the things, and, it, and it's starting, uh, because I was, I heard that the uh, mayor from Pontiac had gotten some of her powers back. But it's always bad when people from the outside come in and make decisions for and about you uh, and think they know what's best for you. So one of the things we do need to do is, you, I believe in, in, in local control. You know, where we are from, it's a strong form of, a strong mayor form of government. And that was what the people that voted. So I just think it's so important for us to listen to what, what the voters have said and start doing that. Um, it, it's, <laughs> some of the questions you're asking, it's really interesting for me because I'd never viewed myself as a politician and well, I didn't. I wasn't. My goal, I told people I didn't go to bed at night and say, when I grow up, I want to be mayor or I want to be in gov government at all. Uh, it's something that just sort of happened. But I think we do need to um, honor the forms of government that are in place and, and not have this dictatorship. I wish we'd go back to some of our revenue sharing because that would give us the funds to do the things that we need to have in place. Uh, those, are, those are, would be some of the things that I believe need to happen. You know, people have said, what about Flint? How can you get Flint on the road to recovery? Is there something that can be done? And I said, well, there's a solution. It's just we don't have the finances. We need the money to be able to do it. Um, and, and there are a lot of things that we need to do and a lot of things we can do, but it's going to take some time. One of the things we know is 
at least for Flint, and I can't speak to the chronology for all of the other cities in Michigan that have been under emergency manager, but for us it's been six years of not being able to make decisions about ourselves. We need to, you know, we've gotten rid of everything. We've gotten rid of everything. You know, it's embarrassing to say, no, we don't have lawnmowers. I mean, when you can't do those basic kinds of things, it's hard to, to get back on the road to recovery. But we, we've got to be able to make decisions for and about us. We know what we need. We know what's best for us. And because some people have made some bad decisions doesn't mean everybody makes bad decisions. But you have to hold people accountable to be able to move forward. And a lot of that didn't happen. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Mayor. Um, just speaking to your faith in local government. Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm Mark. I'm a second year here at the college. Um, uh, so last year, or last summer, I was uh, an intern with the Conference of Mayors. So I see Paul and um, Tom Cochran here. So I know they're helping you out. But I got to witness the strong community of mayors. And so what I was wondering is, how has the mayoral community helped you, whether that's physical resources or advice? Um, how have they uh, helped Flint move forward? That's a really good question, and one of the ways, there have been several ways, well, you see that they are here with me. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when, I, when all of this happened, they got in touch with me immediately. I started, I, I didn't know Tom, I didn't know Paul, I didn't know any of them, and they said, you, you need to come to the Conference of Mayors, we're going to help you. I said, okay, and so I met them, and they were talking with me about what was going on in Flint. And then they came to Flint, and they've been to Flint on a number of occasions. Because one, it's different when you come there and see what's going on firsthand. You get a better feel of an understanding of the situation. And for them to come and talk with the people that are in Flint and realize, oh, I see what kind of situation she's in because I can't talk to these people because they're not going to tell me the truth about what's going on. She really has her hands tied here. And l let's see. Okay, I think that's a good person. I think that's a good person. The other thing they've helped as far as thinking through different problems and uh, how you process different things and how you make things happen and who do you need to go to and where you can get support and to come and stand there with me in front of the Flint community, in front of the media to say we're supporting this mayor and we're gonna help her get the resources that she needs to have. We're gonna put her in touch with people that have been through uh, not quite the same experience, but similar experiences, so she can talk with them and get some information and knowledge from them and be confident about certain things. Um, to m have me come here and help us keep our story out. One of the things I've said, people in Flint are scared that this story will die and no one will know because it took so long to get it out there. They've been very helpful and supportive in helping us continue to keep our story out there because we know as long in, until this situation is resolved that this story needs to stay out there. We, they've also, you know, one of the other things we can't forget is um, what happened in Flint can happen any place when you look at what's going on with infrastructure. And when we talked about infrastructure being more than roads and bridges and looking at what's under the ground because if you can't see it, people tend to forget it. And we need to highlight this. And this needs to be highlighted across the country, paying attention to the water situation and the water quality standards and the frequency with which water is tested. The Conference of Mayors and other mayors have said we need to keep this, we need to spotlight this because what happened in Flint should never happen, shouldn't have happened in Flint, but it should never happen any place else again. So they've been very, very instrumental in, in that. T um, talking to other mayors and keeping this emergency manager law out front. They've been very supportive of that and a voice for that because we know that's a way to take away the people's voice and to take away democracy. So that's the kind of support that I've gotten from them. And so I'm glad you asked that question because I wanted to tell people. Hi, Mayor. Um, Hi. I'm Larry Sanders. I'm a second year master's student at the University of Michigan. I'm also from Detroit, so I'm glad to hear you talk. Okay. Um, this tragedy happened serendipitously, as sadly as I can say that, during the middle of a presidential election, um, which has gotten you guys mainstream attention, which has gotten you, which has helped you guys get the help you need. At the same time, do the citizens of Flint appreciate the attention that you're getting, A, and B, do you expect that attention to, to continue to come to you guys after the presidential election is over with? Well, do we appreciate the, the attention? Yeah. We appreciate the attention because for so long, I, I remember this was while I was still campaigning and a reporter from Detroit called. I'm like, wow, how did you find out? <laughs> how did you find out? And she said, well, I've kind of been following this story. And 
you know, we were happy that they were hearing about it in Detroit because we weren't getting this story out anywhere. So we're glad about the attention. And like I said, not just for ourselves, but for, um, we know we have old infrastructure. We know there's some issues. So we're glad for other people. Um, so we, we need this story out. We want this story to stay out. Somebody asked me, did I think it was being politicized? And I had to say no. I said, because I remember when I was campaigning, they said, that's what I was doing. And I said, well, no, that's not what I'm doing. We, we have a problem. It just happens to, this problem is going on during campaign time. And we, we want the attention. Uh, like I said, it was after the emergency, we were so glad when Rachel Maddow picked this up and got it out there because it gave us that national exposure that we needed. And then for it to come up during the, the presidential uh, debate uh, gave us another level of attention. And so we're glad to have it. And we want to we want to keep it out there because this story shouldn't go away until we're really on the road to recovery. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeremy Brown. I'm with the Extension School. Quick question: About 60 years ago, Boston was in a lot of this situation as Detroit and Flint and stuff like that, a deteriorating um, industrial base, a failing infrastructure, I uh, yeah. institutions leaving the cities and stuff like that. As you can see, we made a massive, significant pivot. What do you think is the systematic problems that are preventing cities like Detroit and Flint from making that same pivot that Boston has? Well, one of the things, Detroit is starting to make that pivot. Uh, Flint's been behind on that because of the other issues that we've, you know, and the challenges that we've had. And so this is our, really this is our chance to make that pivot. One of the things I've said is we have to take this opportunity um, to turn some things around. I keep saying that there's going to be a part two to this story, and I want to, I, I want to be able to tell part two to this story because we do have this window of opportunity. People have been calling and people do want to come to Flint and they've talked about, they understand we have a need for uh, companies and businesses to come and invest. Do we have to get the water situation addressed? Yes, we do. But it's an, it's an opportunity for us. So I, I feel like, you know, people have said, how can you be excited? How can you be happy? I said, well, I'm not happy all the time. I'm mad about this water. I said, but I do see, I see possibility and potential and promise in the city of Flint because we do have an opportunity to make some things happen. And if we, if we don't take advantage of that, then, then we've, we've uh, failed a second time. Hi, um, my name is Sally Marsh. I'm okay, a where is it? right here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm a sophomore in the college, and I'm also a Michigander. I'm from Grand Rapids. Okay. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, but every time, so from the first time I heard Rachel Maddow talk about this issue, and every time I've read an article or hear you speak about it, I just get so angry. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering. I'm sure that you feel like even more so um, that way as as the leader of the uh -huh. city of Flint. So I'm wondering. As you're talking about going on to this second chapter and how you pivot the story, how do you turn as a leader that anger into action and into positivity um, within your community and, and as the leader of the city? Well, some, like I said, sometimes we're angry because sometimes I think that's the appropriate emotion to have. Um, and it gives you some energy too, to do <laughs> some other things. Uh, but you know, it, it's, I'll tell you, one of the things, when I was starting my business, because I, I do have a store, and people said, Are you, you're gonna open up a store in Flint? I said, well, I live in Flint. You know, where else would I open it? And um, I said, but yeah, I, I'm going to open a store in Flint because I believe in Flint. You know, I, I just believe in Flint. And I can drive by a place and I see rundown things or I see nothing there, but I imagine something else being there. Um, and maybe some of it is I've had the luxury to be around long enough, so I remember when Flint was uh, one of the richest cities in the, in the country. I remember when we had a community school system that people came, uh, we were the role model, people came to see our, our community school system and go back and emulate that where they, they live. So I, I do remember those kinds of things. Um, but I just, Sometimes this, this kind of thing gives me energy and makes me excited because for such a long time we felt like we were alone and nobody heard us. And, and I don't think you all know what this does for us uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, the lift that it gives us to know that we're not alone and that we are on the hearts and minds and in the prayers and the thoughts of other people. That helps us, that makes us wanna do things. 
Um, when you have people call and say, we're coming to do this, um, we're gonna have a fundraiser for that, but you have set people saying, um, even when one of the things we talked about was we had the National Guard coming in getting $2 million to distribute water. And we said, wow, we have 16 to 24 year olds that could do that, that, that aren't in school, that don't have jobs. Why don't we make them part of the solution? Because we need to be part of the solution and part of the healing process for ourselves. And so um, one of the things that happened was we got a, a donor came, this was when Clinton came, and a donor came and you know, gave us some seed money to get that started. So not only will they um, start uh, going door to door and doing those water deliveries and the food deliveries, but we're hooking them up with plumbers and we're hooking them up with pipe fitters and with uh, heavy machine operators. I couldn't think of that earlier, but those kinds of things where they will be in, in, a, in an apprenticeship program and they'll get paid for going to school and they can be a productive citizen and contribute to their community. We hope they stay in Flint, but we know wherever they go, they can take care of themselves and, and, and earn a decent living to be able to take care of a family. Um, that was one of the things when people said, well, do you think she's politicizing this? I said, well, I don't know. She put her money where her mouth is on that and helped us. She heard the cry that we said, this makes no sense. We should be putting our young people to work. Um, people are calling and it, it, it helps us. You know, one of the things that happened, this was when I was at the um, leadership for Conference of Mayors and I had never thought about this, but one of the mayors, and I can't remember where he was from, he said, you don't know what you've done for us, what Flint has done for us, because we're coming together as a community, because we're getting things together to send to Flint. We're taking up donations for Flint. And I said, wow, you know, I hadn't thought about that. I said, I'm gonna have to take that back to the people of Flint and let them know, uh, because we hadn't thought of ourselves as an inspiration to others. So all of those things help us. Um, but we have those days where we're just, we're just angry. We're just angry, but we can't stay there too long because we've got to keep looking forward. And things are happening um, even though they're not as fast as we'd like them to be. Uh, they should be moving much quicker. But as long, you know, what's gotten me through is when I can see progress going every single day, it makes you want to get up and keep going. Uh, Michael Scott Jr., graduate student at the School of Ed and a native of Gary, Indiana, um, okay. so not far from Flint, fellow Midwesterner. And so I think about um, not only leadership from the educational aspect, but leadership in the public space mm -hmm. um, and ideally elected leadership. And so when the ghost of a lot of elected officials of color, like a Kwame Kilpatrick, Ray Nagin, Barbara Bird Bennett, are sort of surfing in the space, it's discouraging as a young leader of color to sort of step into the public realm because one, you're sort of competing against those ghosts, but then two, you're also this sense of like being constantly under attack, right? And so be it through the systems of oppression, be it through um, those who are trying to save money in your, off the backs of your community, it's like, why should I attain or want to go into what used to be a very noble profession? And I think a lot of those before us sort of aspire to those things. And so having watched you sort of manage through this crisis um, and been impressed with the poise in which you've approached it, what words of advice would you give to young aspiring leaders of color who are sort of nervous of stepping into that role because of the constant attacks or because of those who may not have left positive um, memories of being leaders of color? I understand. That would be the first thing I would have to tell you. I do understand. We were talking earlier today. I said, because my husband, did, he was not excited. <laughs> and, and part of it was because, well, part of it was because of the attacks, and he hates that. And he said, that's, and, 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 and my sister, she's like, I am your big sister. And, and those two were just really not excited about this at all because of the attack that you come under. And I said, well, you know, I hate that part too, but I can't do anything about it. You know, there's always a part of the job that you hate. So that'll be the part that I hate, but I'm going to do this. Really, it was, if you believe that you can make a difference, you should do it. Um, and that was what I thought is, if I, if I can make a difference, how do I not do it? So that was always my question. How do I not do this? Um, especially if, if you like it. I, I got in, I was volunteering my time. I was trying to help somebody else. 
and I got in and I really enjoyed it and I saw what was going on or what wasn't going on in the city. And um, you know, you're a, if I'm a mental health provider, you're in the helping profession and I thought, how can I not help? Um, but it's hard and you have to be ready for that. And um, sometimes it's nice to be able to prove others wrong. You know, keep that in mind. It's nice to be underestimated. That's always an advantage. Um, but really, you have to stay focused. You just have to stay focused and want to do it and recognize that it's going to be difficult. It's not easy um, because you are. You're going to be under attack. Uh, you're going to be scrutinized. You're going to have to, the standards for you will be different. And, um, but that's going to be in almost anything you do. It's going to be in almost anything you do. And um, I do recognize that there were people in leadership roles that were uh, African American that didn't do so well. But I don't focus on them. I just try to stay focused on what it is I'm trying to do. And if you, if you love it, just do it. You just have to do it. I'm sorry. That's my, I'm sorry. I don't have anything else, but that, that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, over here, please. Uh, hi, I'm Oli. Hi. Thank you so much for being here today, uh, Mayor. I'm also from Michigan, Detroit, uh, originally. But uh, on the flip side, I went to high school in Bloomfield Hills, so I've kind of seen both sides of the, mm -hmm. of the, uh, like the dichotomy that is the state of Michigan. Uh, and you know, obviously now you've mentioned like all the media attention, all the political attention that Flint has gotten has finally made a lot of people like black people, white people, brown mm -hmm. people, poor people, rich people, uh, look at a city that was to a lot of folks previously uh, more or less invisible. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, is basically about um, empathy. So a lot of people I went to high school with, right, they could never imagine living in Detroit or living in Flint. Mm -hmm. And their whole lives, they've never felt like the government is oppressing them or that they're like set at a disadvantage uh, to do the things they want to do in life. So my question is, what would you say to a, a kid or a person living in, in Bloomfield Hills or Gross Point, Michigan, uh, that doesn't necessarily understand what it means to live in a place like Flint or to go through the things that people in Flint have gone through? Uh, what would you say to them about why they should care? Why should not not just now, but when you know uh, the walls of schools in Detroit are crumbling, or mm -hmm. you know the the um, like all sorts of inequalities that places like Detroit, Detroit and Flint experience, not just when there's a water crisis or something that's blowing up in the national media, but on a day-to-day -day basis, why should they care about what's happening in, in Flint? Well, well, you know, and you can't bring everybody to Flint, but sometimes, you know, it's like, just come there and see what it's like and see what people are going through. And you see that the fire stations and uh, churches have been turned into water distribution sites. You know, I said when I came here today, I said it was so nice to wake up in the morning and turn the water on and brush my teeth and not have to use bottled water. But, you know, have them, you know, you, you can't use the water out of your tap. You have to use bottled water for this. Sometimes you're like, do I really want to boil this spaghetti because of how much water it's going to use? Um, show them what's happened with some of the children. Show, tell them about the people that have died, you know, from the Legionnaires, and they really haven't talked a whole lot about that one. Uh, that's been kind of brushed under the rug a little bit, but talking about these people that have died and, and hearing the, their family talk about what that loss has meant to them because it was something that, you know, was preventable. Um, and, and so it's those kinds of things, and really letting them know that, like I said, this is an issue that could happen anywhere if we don't start paying attention to the infrastructure and the water quality. So people have to pay attention to Flint, at least they should, because this can happen in any community, just because we do have such old infrastructure across much of the country. Um, but people also have to have a heart. <laughs> and that was one of the things that I talked about. I said a lot of uh, the emergency manager law and the people that come in place in under emergency manager are, are really people that are just a numbers kind of person. And I remember when I got into City Hall, I said, well, where's the person with the heart here? I need to talk to them. Um, and that part, sometimes it is, sometimes it's difficult. There's, there's some people I haven't been able to convince, you know, and it, 
you're just banging your head against, against the wall. So one thing I've recognized and we've rec recognized is we can't, everybody doesn't, you know, have that kind of empathy. Um, and you, they have to be in that situation or it has to affect somebody they know firsthand before they can sympathize, or, you know, because sympathy and then empathy. Uh, so they have to know somebody that's been affected by it before they can relate to it. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen for years when they say, oh, shoot, this is what the people in Flint must have been feeling. This is what the people in Flint, and it may not even be the same exact situation, but something will happen. But it's, it's difficult. It's difficult sometimes. And when people do come to town, one of the things we've been doing is, let me take you for a drive. Let me show you, let, let, you know, come and talk to the people, come and see what's going on. Come and talk to some of these, these, um, these, these parents whose, whose child isn't doing what they should be doing that you know aren't going to reach their potential because they were poisoned by the water. And then you have these parents and these families that have to deal with mental health issues because they feel tremendous guilt that they were using this water for their kids and it's through no fault of their own or the stress that they have to endure because you know, I have a, a, a special needs child that, be, that was created by some water. That was created by some water. And so I have all of these stresses placed on me now. Um, so we, we take them around to talk to people, to see what's going on, to come into the homes and, you know, see uh, all of the containers that we have and how we have to recycle now and the, the food that people need to get. And, Sometimes that's the only way they're going to see, but we keep telling our story. So we, we can't, you know, everybody doesn't have a heart. <laughs> this is going to have to be our last question. We're almost out of time, but I'm going to try to get one more in here. I'm sorry. Yes, please. Thanks very much. Uh, so my name is Jolene Singh, and I'm a teaching fellow in the Organic Chemistry Lab, mm -hmm. and it's National Public Health Week. So we just saw Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha talk about lead in the water in, a, in an APHA uh, presentation, and we were riveted. Um, and we got to fully appreciate that it's not just lead, it's iron, it's chlorine, it's affecting the pathogens in the water. Even with the switch in the water supply, these are longstanding issues. I work in neurology uh, in my research, so I know this is like a long road ahead. And as a scientist, one, and as a Christian, one of the things I wonder is, as the leader right now, how do you balance or how do you strike a balance between forgiveness and seeking justice um, to move things forward? Forgiveness and moving things forward, I pray. <laughs> and I, I have to do that uh, because it's difficult. Uh, I remember I was talking about, it was after the congressional hearings and uh, the governor, they had just worn him out. And the next morning, we're sitting at a meeting, and we're sitting just like this. And I thought, oh, OK, how do I do this one? Um, but some of it is the only way I'm going to be able to get the things that we have to get is to be able to go ahead and work with them, uh, or anybody else, really. Uh, I, and I, I have recognized that I'm not going to like everybody, but I, I need to I'm still there, I'm, I'm still focused on what it is I'm trying to have happen. Uh, sometimes meetings aren't so pleasant. Um, and it's, it's hard. It's, I'm just going to be honest, that's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. But I do. I, I, I talk to the Lord a lot about what's going on and ask for some input and guidance and am I making this decision right? Am I doing this uh, well? You know, so you rely on faith and um, trying to do the right thing. And so I kind of have to take him out of the picture and say, okay, here's the person that I have to work with that has the, the resources that I need and I have to forget about how I feel and remember the people that put me in office and what I told them I was going to try to do um, because they got me there to do something. And so I just, I keep staying focused on that. Would you all uh, join me in thanking Mayor Wheeler? Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stand up with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. You know, and I, I do, I need to tell you all thank you because like I said, you all are helping us um, really keep our story out there because for such a long time, it wasn't out there. And so we have to, you know, not only myself, but on behalf of the people of Flint, I need to thank you all for really helping Flint and helping us keep our story out there and continue to talk about this and continue to look at those things that I said were important, not just for Flint, but for your cities as well and how you make a difference. So thank you.